Coming up next on It's Personal, brought to you by Gunderson Health System, the Surgeon General is saying that trauma-informed care can reduce mass shootings. What does that mean, and what is the community-wide effort underway to do those kind of things right here in our backyard. Also, we're going to talk about the flu. There are already a couple of cases in the area, and it's only bound to increase. We're going to talk with Megan Meller about that. And finally, a little bit later, planning tips when you're going to that holiday party. Are you going to eat? Probably so. Well, we've got some tips on how to maybe do that in a healthier way. That's all next on It's Personal, brought to you by Gunderson Health System. Welcome back to It's Personal, brought to you by Gunderson Health System. I'm Chris Stoffer. A lot of folks have been hearing about trauma-informed care. We want to find out more about what's going on in that arena locally, but how it also, this is brand new by the way, how it also may help get ahead of mass shootings. Lisey Kettlehut is joining us. She's from Gunderson Health System, but she's also the Trauma-Informed Care Community Coordinator. It's a long title, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. But let's first talk about why trauma-informed care may have an impact on reducing mass shootings. We all want to do something. Let's talk about that a little bit. What does that mean? Well, let's, we just start with mass shootings, which is a topic in this country now, unfortunately. And a lot of times after a situation like that happens, the human brain is exposed to that experience, hears about it, and is trying to make sense of it. So a first question is often, why? And then many people ask, what's wrong with that person? What would lead a person to do something like that? How is that even possible to come through somebody's brain? Yeah. So we start there. And usually the conversation then spins to hardening soft targets, gun control, and we kind of get stuck there. All really good conversations to have and, and do need to have. But when you actually, maybe not the question of what's wrong with that person, but a better question might be, what has happened to this person? And that is what it, it kind of allows us to take a step back and really look at all the different pieces that have led up to being at present point when a decision like that is made. And, and that gives us the opportunity as a community to intervene. So that l- leads to the question, what is happening to these individuals? How can we get a ho- uh, This is two big questions, but uh, what is happening to th- these individuals where the um, thought of a mass shooting enters their brain, let alone the, um, you know, the execution of a mass shooting? Mm-hmm. Well, I can't get into the specifics of what's inside the brain, but what I do know and what the research tells us is that what happens to you as a child impacts behaviors, it impacts many different health problems, social problems, many problems that in a community we've tried to tackle and respond to, and understanding that science allows us as a community to start seeing signs and symptoms of our youth being exposed to trauma and allows us to then have an intervention that can reduce risk. Because that early exposure to adversity in childhood increases the risk, not only for violence, um, which it does, but for health problems, mental health problems, other high risk behaviors. And that's really the science is saying, you have to look earlier and you have to look here as well. Maybe we need a definition too, because I think trauma Mm -hmm. is a word that um, I think a lot of people think of as a as a physical injury. But we're talking about mental trauma in uh, in in a child. What does that mean? Can you define that? And I don't know if you can. So that and good to define that because you're right. We do have different definitions of trauma, especially in a healthcare system. Um, but childhood trauma, what we're looking at is things that can happen during childhood, things that are like abuse, neglect, high or really difficult household challenges, where the child is exposed to those experiences that really overwhelm that child's ability to cope with them, and it starts to impact their health and their well-being and their behaviors. And so it's that type of trauma that we're recognizing and now better understanding. So if we can acknowledge this role of trauma, we can then have, and our community can build a different toolkit for responding to it earlier, trying to reduce the risk for things that can happen later down the road. We're talking with Lacey Kettlehut. She's the Trauma-Informed Care Community Coordinator at Gunderson Health System. 
Um, so how what is the what is the Surgeon General saying then how we can get a, ahead of mass shootings and other issues in our communities? Well, I think he's simply saying, and he's putting it out there, that uh, we have to expand the conversation. We have to have a full conversation that includes present point when a situation like this happens, as well as what were the opportunities that were missed down the road? Uh, these are families that, f- are, for all of us, are in our community and interfacing with schools, healthcare, county systems, our community. And when we notice things, when we notice signs and symptoms, we can really help by strengthening that family and reducing risk. There's so many things that we, we, we talk about resilience. What is resilience? It's um, helping people learn that ability to cope and helping to overcome those areas of adversity. And we can do that. And that's a great transition into the film that has been shown throughout some of the schools and whatnot uh, in our community Mm -hmm. called Resilience. What is this? What, What is this and how can I see it? Yeah, so Resilience is a documentary and it talks about ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. It talks about the science and the correlation, the strong correlation to risks that we see later on. It starts there, but then it also shows and gives a really good visual of a community and different areas of the community that have taken this science and have adjusted their approach to how they do their work, how healthcare approaches um, their patients, how schools are starting to approach different behaviors, and some of the really um, amazing results that they're seeing because of taking a different approach, uh, different statistics that are coming down. As an individual, there are folks listening to this saying, I, I would like to help. I'd like to know more about this. Where do I go? Well, I would start with um, just become more informed about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and what about early exposure to adversity, how that impacts health and well-being across the lifespan. But that's only half the conversation, and too often we get stuck there. It's good to be informed about that, but what are the things that you can do? And that's always the big question. Um, And that's where resilience come in. ACEs don't have to be a lifelong risk factor. They don't have to increase the risk for poor health outbeing outcomes. Um, And resilience is where we really can buffer that risk. Uh, The biggest piece is social connections. Healthy social connections, healthy relational health are one of the biggest buffers to adversity. Very interesting. Now, the Surgeon General has really, um, I think, thrown it out there when he's talking about mass shootings and how trying to get ahead of them through uh, trauma-informed care, through ACEs. And I think that's drawn uh, plenty of attention. But that's not always the result of of, uh, childhood trauma. There are other things that are much more, I'll say, basic that ACEs and trauma-informed care will help with. Can, can you go down that path a little bit? I don't want to have people think that this is only mm-hmm. about mass shootings. It's about a lot of things. Yeah. Actually, adverse childhood experiences have now been connected to over 40 health and well-being outcomes that we see for adults. So it definitely isn't just violence. Uh, there's many physical health, um, heart disease. I could just go down the list, sure. cancers, different things that increase for risk, uh, mental health problems, other high-risk behaviors, addiction, substance use. Uh, and these, uh, what ACEs also allows us to understand is we need to, many of these things are symptoms of things that go a lot further. And as a community, if we only work with some of those symptoms and don't recognize that they're correlated to a problem of areas of experiencing abuse, neglect, or household challenges, we're, all, we're going to be a really busy community only working there, and we need to work with both. And that, uh, that challenges us as a community to then look at average childhood experiences. Our community has a lot of work to do, that's for sure, and uh, as does our, our country and, you know, and the world as well to get ahead of this. Lacey, we really appreciate your time. I hope you come back and we talk about this more and we find out what is new in this area and how the community is tackling it. Thanks for joining us. Mm-hmm. All right, Lacey Catalan, again, she's the Trauma-Informed Care Community Coordinator, and uh, look for the film Resilience. It'll be showing, I'm sure, somewhere near you, and I think it might just change your life and maybe those of our community as well well. When we come back, the flu is here in our region. We're going to talk with Megan Miller about the flu and what not only you need to do, but some of the myths that surround it. That's next on It's Personal, brought to you by Gunderson Health System.
Welcome back to It's Personal, brought to you by Gunderson Health System. I'm Chris Stoffer. The flu's here. Yes, it's been in the area. While maybe not rampant yet, it's only a matter of time. In other states, it sounds like it is hitting and uh, hitting in a hard way. Joining us to talk about the flu is Megan Meller, Infection Control. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Chris. Unfortunately, we got to have you talk about the flu a little every bit. Every year. Yeah. Every year. Yeah. And I know that, you know, you're going to say get that flu shot right away. Um, people worry about the effectiveness, et cetera, et cetera. But for the, for the pediatric pop- population and the elderly population, it's huge. Don't forget the pregnant population, too. That's another s- big population that we really want to... Um, make sure they're vaccinated during this time of the year. Yeah, got to stress that. Um, talk about the flu, though, being in the area. Only a couple of cases uh, reported at Gunderson Health System, but that's kind of the tip of the iceberg from what I understand. Yeah, I mean, there's confirmed cases, and then there's cases of people you know, out in the community where they're not actually going in to, for medical attention because you know they're just fighting it off at home, which is you know perfectly fine. So usually the confirmed cases is just kind of a snapshot of what's actually going on in the community. We know from state reports that activity is starting to kick up a little bit in the southeast western region, so like the Dane County part of the state. So, you know, at that point, it's, it could just be a matter of time before we start seeing an increase in cases here. But it, we take it at a week, you know, just week by week. How bad is it? out there. Um, every year the flu has a different strain. So um, I know you mentioned uh, before we went on air here that there were places, other states, where um, deaths are reported. Yeah, other states are starting to report like, you know, pediatric death here, there, um, or mm. just a, an adult death. But overall, I haven't seen anything to suggest that the flu is ramping up throughout this throughout the country, which, you know, which is encouraging, but that could also change, you know, in a matter of weeks, too. Right, especially as we go into the holiday season where people are having more contact with people from other, mm-hmm. you know, areas oh, of the absolutely, country. Oh, absolutely, yeah. After those, or during those holiday seasons is when you start, do start to see cases ramp up just because there's a lot of mingling going on, which is, you know, what we want to see happen during this time of the year. But then it also means this, you know, cold, number of colds go up and flu cases go up. One of the questions that I have to ask you that I know you get asked about all the time, including from your dad, and that is, okay, I had the flu shot, and I get, I feel weird uh, for a couple of days. Some people say I'm sick after I get the flu shot, so I don't want to get the flu mm-hmm. shot. It's not really getting sick. Can you talk about the that aspect? Yeah, so it's really your body just, like, reacting positively against this this vaccine. It's seeing, okay, I there's this flu virus circulating, I have to mount a response. And so that's how you get the antibodies to develop. So that way when you do get sick from the real thing, you you already have that protection. Your your body's reaction time can be a lot faster to that specific um, mm-hmm. illness, disease. We hear the same thing with shingles vaccines too, that people are like, man, that second shingle shot, like I just felt like like death, like I just, you know, you know, did not want to get up, you know, that second day. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's their immune response. It's doing what it's supposed to do. And so that's what I always try to remind people, you know, if now, if you're truly like full blown sick, it's likely you already had something from, you know, before that was kind of incubating. But if it's just like a mild kind of under the weather, something feels off as you, as you put it, mm-hmm. it's likely just your body putting, you know, just developing a good, healthy re- immune response. Hopefully your dad is listening here <laughs> then to this. Um, talk, if you would, a little bit about the difference between flu symptoms and cold symptoms, because a lot of people will say, oh, I had the flu last year. Probably wasn't the flu. Probably wasn't the flu. And also another thing I hear is like the stomach flu, you know, people oh, confusing yeah. like the upper respiratory flu with the stomach flu. And in that case, if it's the stomach flu, you're more likely it's another virus that mainly affects the gastrointestinal system. Now, in um, the pediatric population, vomiting and diarrhea can occur with the actual flu virus, but that's still relatively rare, and it's it's even rare among adults. Now, between differences between cold symptoms and the flu is, for the flu, your symptom onset is going to be really rapid, whereas with with a cold, it's going to need to be a little bit more gradual. You'll more likely have a fever with with the flu, less so with a cold. 
and you know just overall like that those chills like that headache that people report with a flu you're not going to see much with a cold with the cold it's going to be more like um localized to you know you're going to be congested and stuffy nose like that nasal cough that nasal kind of stuff, cough right? yeah all right we're talking with megan meller infection control at gunderson health system and um one thing we should say is there's still time to get your flu shot there is so plenty of time to go get your flu shot. I, this I, I feel like I can't stress enough. Our, the Gunderson Flu Shot Clinic is open until the day before Thanksgiving, so the 21st. So go get your flu shot if you haven't yet. There are still other, plenty of other locations within the region that are what will offer flu shots past you know that time. Even you know including Gunderson, you know we, there's always still primary care providers who will always offer, you know have the flu shot available for people who want it. Our pharmacies will continue to offer it past that you know November 21st time. So there are still plenty of options f- available for people who cannot you know f- cannot make it to no the cutoff. No matter where you get your flu shot, it's still it's, important for for you and for others in our community. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I always like, like to stress to people like you're not just keeping yourself safe; you're protecting those who can't be protected. There is a large population in our community, those who are under the age of six months, who cannot be vaccinated. So their their protection against the flu is whether either from their maternal antibodies, because antibodies can, can be transferred mm-hmm. through breastfeeding, and all, they can also be transferred through the womb, which is, again, why we want pregnant women to be vaccinated. But then it's also just who you're surrounded by. You know, If your loved ones are fully vaccinated, then it's less likely that you're going to pass the flu onto this young child whose immune system, frankly, is still developing and still learning. Interesting. Now, I know that uh, uh, we're talking to somebody in infection control here, but I'm going to give you the, I'm going to throw you a big softball. You can hit this one out of the park. So holiday season is upon us, not feeling well, got a cold or the flu. Um, Let's just say it's a cold, but you want to hang out with your relatives who you haven't seen for a year or longer in some cases. What do you do? You know, and this is, I can see this being a hard one, just, you know, I'm thinking about myself, you know, like, why would I be in that situation? Because you really want to be with family. Like, you don't want to be alone during the holidays. But at the same time, I think you need to think about who you're going to be interacting with. If you, if you know that most, like, if you're, if you're on, like, the rebound, where, like, the worst of it's over, you're starting to recover, and your family is safe, you know, your family, not safe, you're, like, your family is pretty healthy, then, you know, it I would go, but mm-hmm. still, you know, be aware, like, you know, proper sneezing etiquette, sure. you know, like, don't just, you know, making sure you're washing your hands, doing, like, simple steps, steps like that can really go a long way in, like, keeping you healthy from other people. I've had family members who are like, oh, I'm sick, so I'm not going to kiss you on the cheek. Yeah, that's perfect. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, no, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to hug you because I'm still getting over this. Per- yeah, that's... But we can still be in the same room and have a conversation. We can still have that, you know, at least Mm -hmm. that, like, FaceTime, which is really important during the holiday season. Now, if you're, like I said, like, just sick as a dog, high fever, it's best just, even from your own personal standpoint, just to stay home because holidays can be stressful, you know, and stress can make it harder to recover from some of these illnesses. So even if it's just taking, like, a day or two to say, you know what, I'm just going to lie low here with my like Christmas cookies or mm-hmm. with my holiday meal. And then, you know, once I feel better, you know, I'm ready to mingle. That's great. It's really listen to your body and know, like, know who, what your family needs. You know, if your family mm-hmm. needs to be, if you have an, a sick grandparent, just be mindful of that. Excellent point. Megan Miller, thanks for joining us. And by the way, happy holidays to you. Thanks. Happy holidays to you, too. All right. Megan Miller, Infection Control at Gunderson Health System. Still time to get your flu shot. Please don't forget that. When we come back, we're going to continue with a little bit of a holiday theme. We're going to talk about trying to, well, um, get your waistline in check during the holiday season. How can you eat healthy at a holiday party? We'll talk with Cindy Solis next on It's Personal. It's Personal is brought to you by Gunderson Health System. Welcome back to It's Personal, brought to you by Gunderson Health System. I'm Christopher. Holiday eating is already upon us. 
There's holiday parties, there's Thanksgiving, there's Christmas and everything in between, like leftovers. And for those of us who go into these situations worried about our waistline and how our waistline is going to look after the holidays, we thought we'd bring somebody in to talk a little bit more about it. So we're turning to Cindy Solis. She's a registered dietitian with our nutrition therapy department. Thanks for joining us. I'm glad to be here. So let's talk about holiday parties. We need some tips because there's parties for this, that, and the other thing. It, it might even be a work party. Um, um, but how do you go into it? What's the game plan going into, well, the holiday season, but maybe specifically a holiday party? The first tip I'm going to give you, you might be a little surprised, but give yourself permission to indulge. Okay. One of the easiest ways to so-called blow it is by trying to restrict yourself too much. Okay. And while I say give yourself permission to indulge, still be picky about it. So if you're at a holiday party and you pick up some uh, treats on your plate that you don't like, you shouldn't feel forced or pressured to finish your whole plate or eat all of your food. It's okay to leave the things that you're not enjoying so much. So I grew up in the clean your plate club. You know, my parents were, you know, hey, you're not leaving the dinner table before you uh, clean your plate. Not, yeah. not, a, not a great idea. No, that's not a great idea. All right. Really uh, enjoy the foods that you want and Give yourself permission to leave the ones you don't enjoy so much. I mean, after all, that's why it is a party, right? Your, um, you know, food is a big part of it uh, for a lot of us here in the Midwest. Yeah. Um, Talk a little bit, if you would, about um, some things maybe you should look for if you, you know, are going to a holiday party, things that might be maybe a little bit more healthy, things that maybe you would look for as a registered Mm -hmm. dietitian going, uh, maybe focus on the veggies a little bit, although that's not maybe as fun. Yeah, well, that's a good idea. Usually at holiday parties, you'll find the things like the veggie trays and the fruit trays, and it's good to balance your meal with those things. But even as a registered dietitian, I'm still going to take a slice of the pumpkin pie or the apple pie or enjoy some of those things too. But definitely still trying to be mindful of that balance, so incorporating the fruits and veggies. Yeah, so I think the challenge for a lot of us is that you have that one slice of pie, but then the pie is is sitting there and there's leftovers an hour or two hours later or in the middle of the night. How How do you get around that? So that brings up another good point that a lot of times I like to take about 10 minutes or a little longer after I have my first helping and just kind of let it settle and then decide, do I really feel like having seconds? A little time. Yep, take some time and even considering going for a walk. Mm -hmm. So there's other ways to enjoy the holiday season without having the entire focus be around food. I think for a lot of us at Thanksgiving, it's football and laying on the couch with a nap instead. But a walk does seem like a good idea. Take the dog out, take the relatives out. And most people are motivated. They... If you say you're going to go out for a walk, most people will, you know, at least consider coming along. Absolutely. That. Yeah. So a little exercise burns some of those additional calories. So let's let's talk about um, kind of going into, for example, Thanksgiving Day. So we know we're going to have the big meal. Let's say it's in the afternoon. It might be 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, or noon. How do you wake up in the morning? Or, you know, I know some people say, I'm going to save my calories for, for that big meal and just blow it all at that one big meal. I think I've heard you say in the past that might not be the greatest idea. Can you explain? Yes. So it's important to still be respectful of your hunger and your fullness. Respect your body. So when you wake up in the morning and you know you're having a bigger meal later, don't deprive yourself. Still have your normal balanced breakfast. Um, And then when that meal time comes, you can enjoy it, but you're not feeling like you starved yourself. Because we know that when we deprive ourselves, we're more likely to overindulge, eat too quickly, and eat too much. Skipping breakfast is just a bad idea altogether. It is. Yeah. And it yeah. makes it, uh, I've heard you say in the past that at night, if you skip breakfast in the morning, at night your body is trying to find some calories to get you through the morning hours. Yeah, that can happen too. It's You really need to start your day off right by getting your metabolism going at breakfast time in the morning. And it doesn't always take a lot. No. Um, If you're one to not really feel all that hungry in the morning, even just a slice of toast with a little peanut butter or a piece of fruit, something is going to be better than nothing. All right. We're talking with Cindy Solis. She's a registered dietitian at Gunderson Health System about holiday eating. It's upon us. And 
Uh, frankly, some of us get concerned as we go in because we're worried about what uh, that's going to mean come January 1st and all the work that we have to do. But really kind of coming up with a game plan over the holidays is, is really kind of a good idea. Can you talk about coming up with a game plan over the holidays? Because we do have, there, a, a lot of us have a lot of different events to, to attend, mm-hmm. and there, there's going to be alcohol there, for example, and trying to find, you know, a way to balance it all is the challenge. Yeah. One thing I would recommend is don't overextend yourself. Think about the holiday parties that you have planned for the season, and is it realistic for you to make it to all of those? And when you do make it to those holiday parties, yes, some of them are going to have alcohol. And then having a plan going into that, knowing that it's a good idea to rotate the alcoholic beverages with water. Uh, Not only will that help keep you hydrated, but that should help prevent you from overdoing it on the alcohol as well. All right. They call that a spacer, I think. So you have a drink and then you have water Mm -hmm. and maybe another beverage afterwards. But I know some people say, I'm not going to drink anything after a certain time period. And and it gives them a chance to, you know, uh, recover, if you will, before Mm -hmm. they have to travel or whatnot. But of course, having a designated driver is always a great idea. Um, Last question really for you is more about the party givers, the host. What kind of options should they consider for, you know, obviously we know what's going to be at Thanksgiving, but for, I would say, holiday parties, what kind of options should they have out there to consider all their guests? That's a good question because some of your guests might have food allergies or intolerances. So it's a good idea to be aware of some of those things going into the Just holiday asking party. asking a question might be a good idea. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. So we're finding uh, quite a few people are following a gluten-free diet, um, and maybe that's something that they ha- uh, have to do. It's um, based on a condition. Mm-hmm. Um, so having some gluten-free options wouldn't be a bad idea. And then, of course, there are certain allergies that are very common, like nut allergies allergies too. So knowing if any of your guests have um, something like that going on so you can be prepared and uh, yeah. to prep that food accordingly. Beyond allergies, do you think, um, you know, we talk about the veggie tray, we talk about uh, options like that. Is that, uh, is that a good idea? Um, it seems kind of a simple idea to just have something like that, make sure that there is a healthy option for those people who maybe have come from a holiday party earlier yeah. in the day. Yeah, that's a really good idea to have some of those um, lighter and new, more nutritious options available too. Okay. And then of course, beverages too that are non-alcoholic are always yes. a great option for those yep. holiday parties too. Cindy, want to wish you a, a happy holiday season. We really appreciate your time here on It's Personal. Thank you for having me. Cindy Solis, registered dietitian, nutrition therapy at Gunderson Health System. And by the way, you can always stop into nutrition therapy and get a consultation. I'm sure that uh, they'd be able to help you out either making a holiday plan or maybe uh, making a plan as you head into the new year as well. That's going to wrap it up for this edition of It's Personal, brought to you by Gunderson Health System. I'm Chris Doffer. Thanks for joining us.